This video was sponsored by Policy Genius. Oh, hi. In this video, I'm going to show you how I made this upholstered headboard. Now, I will say that there comes a time in every maker's life where you run into something that you have absolutely no clue how to do it. You've never done it before. And you're left with one of two options. You can either A, get online, research it, and find out the right way to do it, or B, you can just wing it and make it up and go for it and see what happens. Well, in this video, I chose B. I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. I just started making stuff up, and this is what came of it. Is it the right way to do it? I don't know. You can let me know in the comment section. Did I get it done? Yes, and I think it looks pretty darn good, all things considered. So watch the video, see how I did it, and then comment down below and tell me everything I did wrong. Not that I have to tell you to do that. You guys always do that anyways, but enjoy the video. So here's what we have to make, an upholstered headboard to match the bed I just made. There's just one problem. I don't know how to make a headboard. But hey, that's never stopped me before. Let's see what we can do. The first thing I had to do was take some measurements off of this bed that I'm building. Now I say that I'm building because at this point I hadn't actually built it yet because I kind of filmed the headboard part while I was filming the bed building part. Anyways, long story short, the bed is done by the end of the video. For now, I went over to the table saw after getting my dimensions and I cut down two identical sheets of half inch plywood. I'm gonna need two sheets. These are gonna make up the backer portion of my upholstered headboard. Again, remember, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just making this up as I go. <coughs> Bless you. With my two half inch pieces of plywood cut to generally the right shape for my headboard, I decided to give them a little flair by adding a nice curved profile to the two top corners. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why do you need two pieces of plywood for the backer? Well, don't worry, I have a plan. I'm not sure if it's a good plan yet, but rest assured, I have a plan. After tracing out that rounded profile on the top two corners, I grabbed my jigsaw and very quick and simply, I just cut along that pencil line. Then I cleaned it up with a little bit of sandpaper, getting rid of all those bumps and edges until it was nice and smooth and starting to, well, look like a rounded over piece of plywood. Then I carried it over to my partially completed bed and I plopped it in place just to get an idea of whether or not it looked right. I mean, right now it is just a piece of plywood, but it looks like a good piece of plywood. With one piece of plywood cut and the corners rounded over, I grabbed my second piece of plywood and I clamped it on top, making sure all of my edges lined up. See, my plan here is to use that lower piece of plywood as a router template to make a duplicate on the upper piece of plywood. So I just grabbed a little flush cut bit, chalked it up in my trim router, and I started cutting until I now had two identical pieces of half inch ply cut to the right size with nice rounded corners. I'm sure you're wondering where all this is going. Why two pieces of plywood? Why do they need to be identical? Well, here's where that plan comes into play. Eventually, I'll be wrapping fabric around the front of this plywood with some foam in between the fabric and the plywood, and I knew I was gonna have to staple that fabric on the back. Now, the bed is gonna be up against the wall, and granted, you're not gonna see the back of the bed ever, but I still thought that was gonna be pretty ugly with a bunch of staples showing. So my idea was to do the plywood twice as thick, and I could staple the fabric on a little step down and then cover it up with an inserted piece of wood to make it look all pretty. So after grabbing some more random total boat cans, I added a nice rounded profile to the inside of a frame little thing that I traced out with a T-square. Then I just grabbed my jigsaw again and I cut out the whole internal portion of my second identical piece of plywood. Quick and easy. 
Lemon Squeezy. There's one you haven't heard for a while. Once I had all that internal garbage cut out, I now had a beautiful frame with an outside profile that exactly matched my other full piece of plywood. So I sanded it down a little bit to make it nice and smooth, and I plopped it on just to see how it would look. Next, I needed to cut out a piece of wood that would perfectly fit inside this frame. And not just any wood. You see, the entire bed is already made of black walnut, so I figured, well, why not stick with that theme? Luckily, I had a scrap piece of quarter-inch black walnut veneered plywood just laying around the shop calling out to be used, left over from some forgotten project of the past. So I cut it down to the right length and width to fit inside that internal portion, and then using the same can that I used to get the rounded profile on the frame portion, well, I used it to get a rounded profile on this quarter inch piece of plywood. I assumed by doing that, it would fit in there nice and smooth. But knowing me, things are never that easy, so something's bound to go wrong. Maybe? No? Hey, what do you know? It looks like it's gonna fit in there just perfect. Now with all of my backer pieces complete, it was time to start getting serious about this thing. So I took all the pieces over to my workbench, and the next thing I had to do was glue that frame to the full backer sheet of half-inch ply. Now I didn't need a lot of glue, just a thin little bead to hold it in place and keep it from moving around while I stretched some foam and fabric over this thing. So after laying down a nice bead, I plopped it down, and because I'm lazy and didn't want to stop working and wait for glue to dry, I threw a few 16 gauge staples in there just to hold it in place so that I could keep going on this train of, well, not really knowing. Knowing what it is I'm doing. But for now, the woodworking is done. That's the part I'm comfortable with. Next up, the questionable part the actual fabric and foam upholstery scene. Now I went to my local fabric store that just happened to sell this furniture foam in sheets of I think around six feet by 24 inches. Unfortunately, that wasn't quite tall enough, so I was gonna have to cut two sheets and somehow glue them together. But the first thing I needed to do was, oh, hey there, Mr. Foreman, how's it going? The first thing I needed to do was cover my work surfaces in some paper. They were mighty dusty and I didn't want to get this foam all dirty. So after making sure I had a nice clean work surface, I laid out my foam and I plopped down my plywood backer. Now I wanted to trace out this plywood backer so I could get a piece of foam that matched that shape. But I was also very aware that after I started stretching the fabric across this foam, it was gonna shrink a little bit. So I decided to leave a one inch overhang on all of the sides that I could kinda pull the fabric tight around. So having the mindset of a woodworker, I grabbed a one inch setup block and I started using it to trace a one inch perimeter around the entire piece of plywood. Now, I made a big mistake here. I should have pushed the entire thing over to one side to reduce the amount that I had to cut out. Instead, like a moron, I just plopped it down in the middle and went to work, making my cutting struggles double. But that's okay. You live, you learn, and you move on. After I got a nice one inch perimeter around the entire outside of the plywood backer, it was time to cut this sucker out. But how to do that? The only thing I really had at my disposal was a box knife. I figured, I mean, just foam, that's gonna work, right? I have heard tell of using an electric carving knife like you'd use to cut out a turkey, but I didn't have one of those. And I wasn't about to go buy one for this one project. So a box knife it was. And it worked great on the first pass that was about an inch deep. Not so much on all the other passes, but I just kept going, refusing to admit defeat, and before long, I had a pretty roughly cut out shape of the headboard on one side. Four more to go. But I stuck with it, and slowly but surely, 
I had made a giant mess. Um, meaning I had little bits of foam and debris all over me. Ugh, get it off me. Get it off me. But the important part was my pieces were cut out. Now that they were cut out, they were still in two pieces, and I had to figure out some sort of way to adhere these two pieces together. They didn't have to stick super good, they just had to stick well enough that they weren't going to flop around while I figured out how to get the fabric stretched over them. So I did what any good builder would do. I found a can of craft spray adhesive. I don't know why I had this in my cupboard, but I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a try. So I sprayed a nice liberal coat onto both sides of the foam, and I plopped it together. And would you believe it actually worked really, really well. This particular adhesive spray sticks on contact and gets harder over the next five to 10 minutes. So I applied a little pressure and I just let it sit and do its thing. Next, I retraced a, another one inch border on my foam, this time on the inside, to allow me to plop down my plywood backer in the correct place. And because that spray adhesive worked so well to glue the foam to itself, I decided I might as well use it to glue the foam to the plywood. So after spraying two more liberal coats on the plywood and the foam, I very carefully lined it up on my marked out border and I set it down. Now remembering that pressure made the bond stronger, I decided to give it as much pressure as I could give it. I think I'm doing this right. Now it was finally time to start wrapping some fabric around this thing. But in the process of gluing the backer and the foam and everything, I got a little glue on my original pieces of paper. So I laid down some fresh paper and started unfolding the fabric. Now you might recognize this fabric. It's the same green canvas that I used for the shuffleboard build. I liked it so much paired up with the dark black walnut that I decided to use it again for this headboard. Then reaching down deep inside and remembering what I learned in home ec class in eighth grade, I pulled out an iron and ironed out all the wrinkles. Well, as many as I could get out. Then I thought it would be a good idea to have something between the fabric and the foam. I don't know. So I bought this bag of cotton batting that I also found at the fabric store. It was next to the furniture foam, so it seems like it might be something you'd use for upholstery, but I really have no clue. This could be completely wrong. After aligning it and making sure there was no little particles trapped between the batting and the foam, making sure that the batting would stretch up around the foam enough to get some staples in it, I was ready to start hooking this thing on. So I did what any upholstery person would do. I grabbed my 16 gauge pneumatic stapler and I started going to town. Now I will admit the first few attempts at this were horrible failure because the staples just blew right through the cotton batting. But after adjusting the stapler so that the pressure was as low as it could possibly be, the staples held the batting nice and secure into that edge of the plywood. Now you notice I'm not wrapping this batting up all the way around like I mentioned I was going to do with the fabric. I figured I'd do a little stair step situation. Wrap the batting up to the edge of the plywood and then wrap the fabric all the way over the top down on that lower tier. So after completely stapling my batting all the way around, I just took a little X-Acto knife and I give it a little trim, like it was a wee little sheep on the Scottish moor. I understand that reference would make a lot more sense if this was wool, but you get the picture. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is a good time to stop the video and thank our sponsor, Policy Genius. Now, if you're like me, you start getting to the end of the year and you start thinking about your New Year's resolutions for next year. All the things you wanna do next year that you didn't get done this year. Well, one thing that you still have time to do this year and you can already cross off your list is making sure that your family is protected with a good life insurance policy. 
Now I know it sounds complicated. I know it sounds difficult and hard, like there's a ton of paperwork and it's a big headache, but it's not because Policy Genius makes it easy. And yeah, I'm gonna tell you how right now. In minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Their licensed experts will help you understand your options and ensure you apply for the right policy. You see, Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies. So you can trust them to offer unbiased advice to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying process. And when you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. If you're like me, you're probably thinking, that sounds amazing, what do I do next? Well, I wouldn't leave you hanging. Just listen, I'm gonna tell you exactly what you need to do. It's not that complicated. All you gotta do is head to policygenius.com slash bourbon moth to get started right now. Really, that's it. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. But this board still needs a little work. With all of my batting on and looking quite good, I mean, I have no clue what it's actually supposed to look like or whether or not you're actually supposed to use batting. Who knows? But I'm making this up so I can say it looks good if I want to. I was ready to start attaching the canvas to my plywood backer. I started with one side, just focusing on getting it nice and smooth, stretching out all the wrinkles, not worrying too much about pulling it tight at this point. I figured I'd just get it all stapled on one side and then I'd pull it nice and tight once I moved over to the other side. Speaking of which, here's a nice shot of me, well, pulling it nice and tight. Now I realized pretty quickly here that almost more importantly than pulling the fabric tight was pulling it evenly, making sure there was even pressure along that entire edge so that there wasn't humps or dips on the top or bottom of the headboard. So every once in a while I'd flip the whole thing over and take a good look, making sure that it was nice and even and that I wasn't creating any wrinkles on the front of the headboard. Then I moved over to either end and I pretty much did the same thing, completely ignoring the fact that I was going to have to do something with these corners. When I got to the corners, I decided the best course of action would be to just pull it as tight as I could and try and make all the little wrinkles that were created look intentional, almost like little pleats on the corner. I was fairly successful. One could say that if you had poor vision and stood back far enough, it would look perhaps like a professionally pleated corner, but I'll let you be the judge of that. In no time, I had all the sides stapled securely to the back, stretched fairly tight and looking somewhat decent, if I do say so myself. At this point, we have a pretty nice looking canvas wrapped, cushy, soft headboard. But I wasn't quite satisfied. I thought it looked just a little plain. It needed something else, a little flair, a little pizzazz. Something that would obviously require more skill than I possessed, and I had absolutely no clue how to do. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. But before I could get to that, I needed to cut off all the excess fabric on the back so that I had a nice, clean surface to work on. With all the fabric removed, you guessed it. I grabbed a drill, and I just started drilling holes. Don't worry, don't worry, I have a plan. You see, I thought it would be cool to add some tufts to the front. In my little pea brain, I thought it would be a simple task. Just drill some holes in the back, send a needle through with some thread, loop it around, send it back through the hole on the back, and boom, you've got tufts. I mean, how hard could it really be? But remember, I don't know what I'm doing, and sometimes, things that seem simple in your head, well, they're not really as simple as they seem. After drilling my holes in the back, I marked out exactly where I wanted those tufts to land on the front. 
Now, because this is something I did not know how to do, I decided to start with just three tufts. So I went to the fabric store, I bought the biggest needles they had, and some embroidery thread that was the exact same color as my canvas. I threaded my little needle, and I thought to myself, yeah, I'll just shove this two inch needle through four inches of high density foam. <laughs> no problem. So I went around to the back, I stuck my needle in, and quickly realized this was not gonna work. Not only was it hard to stick the needle through the foam, there was no way I was gonna find that needle on the other side of the headboard. See, it's just too darn small. It won't go in there. And it hurts my fingers to try. So, forget that. Like any good woodworker, I got on Amazon and I found this bad boy. A 10 inch long upholstery needle. Yeah, apparently that's a real thing. This should do the trick. Now, with a boost of confidence with my bigger needle, I marked out some more tufts. I mean, if I'm gonna go for it, I might as well just frickin' go for it. Keep in mind, I hadn't even tested the larger needle yet to see if it was gonna work. I was just pretty confident it was gonna work. So with all my new tufts marked out with little pieces of tape, I stepped back and once I was satisfied with how many there were and how they were aligned, I took a little fabric pen, yeah, apparently that's a real thing too, and I just marked out a little plus sign everywhere I wanted a tuft to land. My idea was to mimic that plus sign with the actual embroidery thread. Then I went to the back of the headboard and I drilled out a bunch more holes for all the new tufts that I just created. But you don't need to see me drill out every single hole. Now I also decided to double up on the embroidery thread. So each loop would be actually two layers thick of thread instead of one. So I went to the back of my headboard and I poked the needle through searching for my little plus sign. This took a little pulling it in and pulling it out, realigning it, trying to get it just on the right position before it finally landed where I wanted it to. And I pulled it through, made sure I had enough string coming out, and then I pushed it back in. This is gonna be easy. Oh, stupid, simple Jason. I poked and I poked and I poked, trying to find that hole. And then finally, I was like, this just isn't going to happen. For the life of me, I could not poke it back through that tiny little hole. So when in doubt, drill more holes. Instead of two holes, I changed it to about eight holes. I figured that would really up my chances on that needle poking back through. Have I mentioned that I have absolutely no clue what I'm doing? So I went back around to the other side and I started poking again. In and out, and in and out. Come on, eight holes? I gotta be able to find it now. I mean, how many places can this flippin' needle go? Alas, I finally got it to poke through. There it is. Now I just gotta pull this thing tight and see if a tuft appears. Wait for it. Wait for it. Hey, it actually looks like a little tuft. This might conceivably work. After securing one loop, I poked it back through the hole and secured another loop. This involved more in and out and in and out until I eventually found the hole and was able to pull through my second loop. Now continuing on with this theme of not knowing what I'm doing, I thought about trying to tie a knot back here, but in the end, I just grabbed my staple gun and started stapling. I'd staple over the thread, and then I'd fold it over on itself, and I'd staple over it again, and then I'd fold it over on itself, and I'd staple over again. This is probably not how you're supposed to do this sort of thing, but it actually worked really well, and I have no doubt that that thread is not coming out of there anytime soon. So with one tuft under my belt, I now only have, um, oh, about 17 more to go. I better get to work here. 
So I started poking and pulling and pulling and poking and stapling and poking and stapling and pulling and well you get the picture all the time trying to land exactly on those little plus signs I drew with my handy dandy fabric pen until slowly but surely beautiful tufts started appearing all across my custom upholstered headboard were they perfect well, no, I mean, I'm making this up as I go along. But they were my tufts, darn it, and I was proud of each and every one of them. I did pick up a few little tricks the farther I got along to make my life a little easier. For one, I abandoned the eight little holes that I drilled at the beginning, and I opted for four larger holes. This seemed to work way better when it came to finding that hole on the return journey of my thread, and in turn made my life much, much easier. I was down from like 40 pokes to find the hole to maybe like five, and I was feeling pretty good about everything. Sure, it's got a little wrinkle here and there, but I'm thinking those will probably iron out, right? With the actual upholstery part complete, all I needed to do was clean up this back panel and make it pop. Now, because my little insert piece was a quarter inch thick and my plywood ring was a half inch, I needed to add some quarter inch spacers to bring up my inserts that would be flush with the back. So I just took some off cuts of that quarter inch black walnut ply and I stapled them down. Then I pre-finished this back piece of walnut. Obviously you don't want to finish it next to that canvas. It'd get all ooey and gooey. And I plopped it in there to see if it fit. It was a little tight now that I had the fabric in there, but nothing a good fist mallet wouldn't fix. And before long it was seated quite nicely actually. And the back of this headboard was looking almost as good as the front. Now, I thought about just stapling this in place as well, but you'd see the staples, and I just wouldn't be happy with that. So instead, I just squirted a little glue on all of those plywood spacers and plopped it on top. This isn't going to need to be held super strong. I mean, it's just got to stay in there. Once the mattress is pushed up against the front and it's secured to the bed itself, it's not going anywhere. So after getting it seated, I lifted some weights. But not just to get ripped. I mean, I'm already ripped, let's be honest. I set the weight in the center of this plywood to, you know, hold it firm against that glue. And because I only have one weight randomly in my shop, I also grabbed some jugs of epoxy and a paint can. The next morning, I came out, removed all of those random assortment of things, dusted off the walnut ply um, Jason you missed a little spot right there it's gonna drive me crazy thank you and we were ready to set this in our bed I mean look at that that looks pretty clean if I do say so I'm not saying it looks perfect I'm saying it looks pretty clean and the front of course well <laughs> that just looks dropped it gorgeous in my opinion but I might be biased and looky there, magically, somehow in the course of all this, the bed miraculously got complete. So all I needed to do was set the headboard in place and take a good gander at it. It really is sad that the back of this bed will always be pushed up against a wall, and nobody except you and me can appreciate how much time I spent making it look clean. But I guess that's what separates a good woodworker from a smart woodworker. The last and final thing I needed to do was actually attach the headboard to the bed itself. This was very simple. I just marked out a few points on that back brace piece and then using a countersink bit chalked up in the drill, I drilled a few countersunk holes. And I just plopped in a few screws and boom, installed or something along those lines. And just like that, our headboard was complete. I mean, it's not perfect. I will be the first to admit that. I could probably do it better if I tried again, 
and I could do it even better than that if I hired a professional who actually knew what they were doing to do it. But it was a fun project, an experiment if you will, to see if I could do something without any research and make it look somewhat presentable. I did it. Kind of. Polster headboard. Did I do it wrong? Probably, and I'm sure you'll let me know in the comment section. If you're mad because I just didn't do any research and I went for it, well, if you want to teach me a lesson, you could subscribe down below or go follow me on Instagram. Maybe check the links in the video description for all the tools I use, buy some of those. There's a link to my Patreon page. You could go over there and just toy with me, you know, maybe support me on Patreon at any one of the three tier levels. I mean, if you're really mad and you want to teach me a lesson, do those, because boy, I'll be upset about it. All right, I'm gonna go buy a mattress.